This episode of the Jerry Paul Podcast is CME eligible. To claim credit, please go to the CME tab on jerrypal.org. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Quadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we're delighted to welcome George Cushell, who is a geriatrician and chief of geriatrics and director of the Yukon Center on Aging at the University of Connecticut. George, welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. Hi, guys. Nice to be on. And we're delighted to welcome Allison Huang, who's a primary care doc and researcher and professor of medicine, urology and epibiostats at UCSF in the Division of General Internal Medicine. Allison, Allison and I go way back. Welcome to Jerry Pal. <laughs> Thank you. Delighted to be here. A little known fact, we go way, way back. <laughs> Allison and I were in med school together. She invited me over to her apartment to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Nice. I accepted, wow. went there, and met my future wife, Cindy Shu. No way. Really? Yep. Yes. Also a med student. Yep. All wow. thanks to Allison. I like to take credit. That's <laughs> real history in the making. Well, before we start on our topic, which is urinary incontinence, we always ask for a song request. Who has a song request for Alex? Well, I think we want to go with Oops, I Did It Again by <laughs> Britney Spears. <laughs> Very apt for the title of Urinary Incontinence. I suggested Even Flow. It's a good we'll one. We'll do that on, save that one for a future <laughs> podcast. I do like that one. <laughs> and someone else suggested Under Pressure, but we had already done it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, we did Let It Go on our last podcast about urinary incontinence with Scott Bauer and uh, Chrissy Kissler. All right, here's a little bit. I think I did it again I made you believe We're more than just friends It might seem like a crush But that doesn't mean I'm serious Cause to lose all my senses That is just so typically me Ooh baby baby Oops I did it again I played with your heart, got lost in the game Oops, you think I'm in love, I'm sent from above I'm not that innocent <laughs> That was great, Alex. Britney Spears has got nothing on you. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Well, uh, we got we got a lot to cover on today's podcast. We're going to be talking about urinary incontinence. And I'm going to start off with you, George. Like, how do you think about this? Like, is this just a bladder problem or is this a bigger, you know, geriatric syndrome problem? So I would say that as many, many clinical issues in older adults, we need to think about them in two ways. Incontinence and voiding issues can present in an older individual, in some cases, just like they do a younger person. You know, you, you certainly can have a, a, a as, as Allison knows well, you can have an old, older lady who has stress incontinence while coughing or, or, or playing tennis, just like a younger woman, and, and the issues are essentially the same. But then there is incontinence, which is the same term, same word, but actually presents as a geriatric syndrome. And it's, it's really a diff different kettle of fish. The only thing they have in common is that that involves is the outcome, which is incontinence, and the billing code. <laughs> but as as a term implies, they're geriatric syndromes, and and uh, what that means is these are these are multifactorial conditions that occur later in life, most typically, and so they have multiple etiologies. There's no single risk factor. There are multiple different risk factors, both predisposing and precipitating, just like we see with delirium, just like we see with frailty and other geriatric syndromes. And the other thing they have in common is that geriatric syndromes cross typical boundaries. You know, they, they cross typical, as your question alluded to, it's not just a bladder problem, but but issues having to do with mobility and fluid balance and, and cognition are, are closely, closely related. So yeah, so similar yet very different. Yeah. It, why is it associated with aging? Like what's the aging component, just that these things like functional issues are common in older adults, cognition issues are common in older adults. Is there something about what's going on there that we see that age is right. the most common risk factor for these things? No, it, it is. And, and, and uh, 
the, 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 both the incidence and prevalence of incontinence, both men for men and women, goes up dramatically with, with age, uh, and and with aging. Uh, but but the geriatric syndrome is really a condition of late life, and 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 the way the way of thinking about it is that all of these predisposing risk factors, both the uh, the predisposing and the precipitating, their likelihood goes way up with age. Yeah. Um, as as a, as as the, the the incidence of other geriatric syndromes. A, another way of thinking about it, which as a clinician in the past probably had less meaning, but it's likely to have more meaning moving forward, is that is that biological aging itself is is the most important risk factor for how fast we age. You know, everybody ages. Chronological age is one measure, but biological aging or physiological aging varies from individual to individual. And and there's now increasing evidence, as I'm sure Scott Bauer discussed when he he met with you, because he does a lot of work in this space. And for those who don't know, Scott actually joined us for a Jerry Powell podcast on lower urinary tract symptoms. And, and Go he ahead, George. Focuses on that, particularly yeah. in, in older men, but he's very interested in the issue of of the role of g- geroscience and gerotherapeutics, the role of biological aging in, in, in driving avoiding issues yeah. and and incontinence with aging. And yeah. we can talk about that later in terms of potential clinical implications that it may have down the road. And then, Allison, is the urinary incontinence the right word I sh- should be using here, or is it under the bigger umbrella lower urinary tract symptoms? How do you think about this from a clinical perspective w- when you're seeing individuals in your office? Yes, great. I mean, we use the term urinary incontinence to refer to unwanted accidental leakage of urine, right? Yeah. And it's one of a variety of lower urinary tract symptoms. Some might argue it's the most bothersome or disruptive or impactful of, of, low, of lower urinary tract symptoms, and especially common in older women and yeah. older adults broadly. George... Um, is such a leader in the field and knows well, you know, all the work that's being done to look at what kind of age-related changes do we see in the urinary lower urinary tract. There's work, you know, describing changes in bladder muscle contractility and bladder capacity and enervation of the lower urinary tract and pelvic, you know, floor support. We might argue, though, we don't know that much about, gosh, which of these changes really are important in the symptoms that people have. You know, it's easy to describe physiologic or tissue specific or organ specific changes. Not so easy to really figure out which of these changes associated with aging are really meaningful in, in patients' experience of symptoms. And perhaps hardest of all, right, to translate our knowledge into treatment and preventive strategies. There, we may do very poorly, right? We, we have a, where we can describe our beautiful models of all yeah. the kind of risk factors and contributors ranging from like organ level, patient level, behavioral, contextual, environmental, and yet acting upon these factors in a way that really changes patients' outcomes has been really hard. Yeah. And it, it's also hard because oftentimes people don't even bring this up in clinic. Do you screen for lower urinary tract symptoms, incontinence? And if so, how? I do, only because, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an area of interest for me. But your thing. if I'm honest, right, if it weren't, w- would I consistently? You know, of course, this is all of us who are clinicians are under such pressure to address yeah. so many issues and short visits. You know, the standard line about urinary incontinence being don't ask, don't tell. You know, patients don't bring it up spontaneously. Clinicians don't ask about it. It's under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated, under-discussed, under-studied, right, as a result. Uh, and all these things lead to the fact that, you know, even though we believe that more than a third, close to half, perhaps over half of, for example, older women have some degree of chronic or recurrent urine incontinence, uh, less than half are engaged in any kind of treatment that yeah. they think is helpful to them. Yeah, right. I'm glad you mentioned this, like reluctance to bring it up and reluctance for clinicians to ask. There's such a stigma around urinary incontinence in our society. I'd be remiss if I didn't channel Ken Kavinsky, who I think is right now on vacation in Alaska. Lucky you, Ken. <laughs> uh, but who um, who would say something at this point like, why isn't it just more socially acceptable to have some leakage? Yeah. Like, why can't we just change the norms around this so that it's okay and it's a natural part of aging? Why do we have to make yeah. this into a condition, a disease, a syndrome? But Alex, yeah. it's not—it's not just uh, it's not just a stigma of it. It's also there's also a lot of what, what people have called nihilism. You know, this attitude where people don't bring it up, not only because they're ashamed of it, but also because 
because they feel that this is something that nothing can be done about. And they may have personal experiences. Uh, I've seen, I'm sure Allison has seen older older women who, who don't bring it up because because they brought it up before and nothing was done about it, or because they had sisters or mothers who had the issue for years and years and nothing was ever done about it. So there's, there's also a sense of why, why talk about it when you can't do anything about it. I think, uh, you know, this makes me think of a pilot project that I'm working on now with well, other incontinence researchers and folks, uh, Elaine Markland, also folks uh, who are interested in sort of, uh, you know, improving access to care across diverse populations and patients with limited English proficiency. But we're sort of engaged in this effort to try and create more resources uh for say, you know, Spanish speaking Latina older women, Chinese speaking Chinese American older women. And a lot of our discussion in sort of going through translated texts of these is struggling with the vocabulary, sort of do we use the formal word for incontinence that, you know, not many people know, uh, uh, or do we use the sort of colloquial term that people don't want to say because it's considered offensive or, you know, just even our vocabulary, our terms, the concepts, just culturally, socially are hard to discuss, right? It's what, What's it's the it's colloquial term? term? Like leakage or? Well, sometimes maybe leakage is, is better to say than incontinence. Maybe more people will understand. Yeah. But but if you need, you need to talk about body fluids, you oh, need to pee. talk about, <laughs> you need to talk about, you need to talk about, you know, fecal matter, you need to talk about all of this. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. It's not easy. I had yeah. a patient recently um, talk about how she was sitting with a group of her uh, older female friends and they were talking in conversation. Oh, that, that how they say like one in three women have this problem. But, but, you know, there's three of us here and none of us have this problem. And she was silently thinking to herself, I have this problem, but I'm certainly not going to say anything now. Perhaps they all had the problem and yeah. none of them wanted to say we, we are one of the women. Um, so it I, is, it's, I guess in, the, in, in, let's say, my a clinic, if I was going to ask like one question about this, just as a screen, is there a way to ask this question that is not both stigmatizing, but people also understand and it gets around some of these issues? George, I don't know if you have your, your favorite question. I mean, I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Allison. Go ahead. You, I, mean, I may more tend to start by normalizing it some. Right? Yeah. To start with like, you know, Many midlife and older women experience some leakage of urine. Do you right. ever leak urine, even a small yeah. amount? Exactly. And I think sometimes using kind of more neutral terms like talking about voiding, talking about any issues with the waterworks, you know, and, and also questions having to do with sleep. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to realize that sleep, yeah. avoiding sleep and cognition, and, and they're all very closely intertwined, you know, and, and so... Often these discussions begin with begin with how do you sleep? How many times a night do you wake up? And 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 uh, and then also questions about independence. You know, it's not just about avoiding. But I've seen many cases where patients come in and and they're basically homebound. And then you you see that you know they shouldn't they shouldn't be homebound. Their mobility isn't that bad. And then you realize the reason they're homebound is because you know they have urgency or urgent continence literally every hour, every half hour, and they just can't they can't get away long enough. Well, Go ahead, Alex. Eric is pushing on the like the clinical practical stuff, but I, before we dive too deep into that, I just want to take one more step back. George, on this podcast, we have talked about your model for frailty um, probably like three, four, five times. Um, and I don't know if that's just because it's the Golden Gate Bridge and it's I was just going to say that there's a there seems to be a geographic <laughs> bias there. There's, there's definitely a geographic and, and, bias. And Allison has it behind. Has, you guys like putting up as you like like putting up behind you on Zoom, right? <laughs> and and when people think about frailty and they think about uh, and just so for our listeners, just to remind them, the idea is that Golden Gate Bridge, Bridge is a model for frailty. And George, maybe we could get you to explain why that is. And also, why is it that somebody who's one of their main foci is urinary incontinence was the one to come up with this model of frailty? Is there any relationship between frailty and urinary incontinence? Well, it, it, multiple. First of all, they're both geriatric syndromes. They're both multifactorial Conditions happen late in life. Uh, they, they have impacts across all organ systems, and ultimately, you know, frailty is a major is also a risk major risk factor for voiding issues and incontinence. And all of these geriatric syndromes are interconnected. So, um, if you go further, 
And this actually goes back to work that was really important, the work that was done by, by Mary Tinetti and her colleagues years ago, uh, showing that these geriatric syndromes have shared risk factors. So, so if you look at incontinence and frailty, there are conditions such as one risk factor they share is declines in mobility. If you're less mobile, you're more likely to be frail, more likely to be incontinent, and, and many others, you know. So, and that's what makes, you know, these issues so challenging, because at one level, you use, we use the same term to refer to that incredibly multifactorial, complicated, complex condition as we do to stress incontinence, which is also complex in its own way. But but th- the solutions, as we'll get to in, in a few minutes, are completely different. There may be some overlap, but the approach and the solutions are completely different, requiring different different skill sets. And, and, and that's, that's the challenge. So I'm going to have a link to the to the analogy on the Golden Gate Bridge, so we don't have to review that in, in some. Sorry, Alex, because I do want to get to the practical yeah. things. Like, yeah. let's say you have that person coming in into your office complaining of these symptoms, uh, maybe even every hour. Allison, how do you think about it? I'm gonna because George mentioned like stress or urge incontinence. Do you think? Do you put into the four buckets stress, urge, mixed, and overflow? Or is there something else that's kind of guiding how you're thinking about the workup as your screener is positive? So I do think that the common sort of clinical types of incontinence that we think about, I do think that's useful in guiding initial treatment approaches. We, we recognize that there could be overlap. We, we recognize that as uh, as adults get older, they're, they are more eclectic. Uh, increasingly likely to have mixed incontinence so that no one single clinical or physiologic mechanism may be responsible for symptoms. But but still, like thinking about older, uh, especially women more than men who have primarily stress type incontinence can direct us to think more about treatment strategies that are focused on supporting the pelvic floor that supports the bladder. Right? Uh, we can think about women who have, and men who have primarily urgency, you know, associated incontinence, uh, perhaps associated with overactive bladder, and then think about what kind of strategies are going to help decrease unwanted bladder muscle contractions that send people rushing to the bathroom and maybe not getting there in time. Uh, We we can really recognize that for a lot of people, these are mixed, that it's not one type, or that it's hard for people to distinguish, right, really, really tell you what kind of leakage they're having. Leakage that occurs in the middle of the night, leakage that occurs after they stand up after having used the bathroom. You know, what, what are these kinds? And overflow incontinence, which does tend to be a little less common in older women, I'd say, than older men, um, partly because right, there aren't the same issues related to the prostate. Certain surgical risk factors, you know, can play more of a role there with some older adults and others. So I, I think you right, like initial approaches, really thinking about is this somebody where we should be focusing on the pelvic floor? Is this somebody where we should be focusing on bladder muscle um, overactivity yeah. or oversensitivity, perhaps sometimes? Uh, or is this somebody who just the bladder is not emptying? Um, yeah. And George, from your perspective, you know, you hear a lot about urge incontinence for for women, and for men, you hear a lot about overflow incontinence, you know, BPH and large prostate. Is urgency? or I guess for that matter, is stress uh, incontinence? Are, do we see them commonly in men? So stress incontinence per se is less common in men for, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, urge urge symptoms are common in, in, in both in both, mm-hmm. both both genders. Yeah, um, Stress incontinence is much more common in, 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 in women. Uh, but but as, as Allison said, you know, typically in terms of these, these class, these bins, if you will, these simple bins, they kind of fall apart with aging because more and more older adults have combinations of these. It, and it turns out, actually, it was a classical study published by Neil Resnick in New England Journal of Medicine many years ago, which was a nursing home study of more than 100 incontinent nursing home residents study of urodynamics, and it showed that actually the most common condition that you see in that population associated with incontinence is actually a condition that's associated, and it's kind of paradoxical, both the bladder being both overactive and underactive at the same time. It was back then, it was called DHIC, the truth or hyperactivity and paracontractility. But that combination is actually quite common and it's quite challenging to diagnose and, and, and manage, at least in the traditional sense. So you got a bladder that both can't squeeze very well and is squeezing all the time. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Contractions occur when they shouldn't, and when they do, they're not particularly effective. 
because well, I I want to hold on to that. We're going to parking lot that because I, I want to talk about how we treat these different conditions. Right. But before we get into that, how do you think about the further workup once you're getting down this this line, let's say, for like urgency or stress? Well, to me, the first part of the workup is, is the history. The history is really the most important. And, and uh, yeah, getting a sense of which bucket it falls, you know, which of these diagnostic buckets in falls in it's important to some extent yeah. but even more important is is when you know it's like cl- traditional history taking you know and and when is the person when does the person leak what what worsens it what provokes it what makes it better and what impact does it have on their qual- on their life and and uh, that, that that can be incredibly informative now again in in, in the context of a busy vi- busy clinical visit you may not have the time to really go through it in detail. So one thing that we found, well, not just us, but it's, it's very commonly used in, in, in the diagnosis and management of incontinence and frail older adults is incontinence as a geriatric syndrome is a 48-hour voiding record. And, and what we actually do, and there are many versions of this, you can actually create it yourself. It's very simple. It's What we do is we, we actually mail this to, to our patients before they come in as part of well, more and more people were doing this also through the inpatient portal because we were trying to get as much information in there as possible to to cut down the amount of information you have to collect during the visit. But a simple 40-hour voiding record, which is just two two sheets of paper, um, just basically asking the patient or the caregiver or both to fill in, you know, when did they void, when did they have leakage, what time an estimate of the, of the volume, um, you know, rough estimate, and also what provoked it. And and that can be incredibly powerful. I mean, I can, and informative. I remember as a geriatric fellow many years ago, uh, we actually diagnosed a patient who had polyuria, who ultimately, you know, turned out to have diabetes insipidus. Because when you looked at how much they were avoiding, they were just avoiding way too much. And, and of course, much more common cause of polyuria is drinking too much <laughs> Uh, Coke, you know, too much Coca Cola, <laughs> or or whatever, you know, but but that kind of information can be incredibly yeah. informative, both from a diagnostic point of view, but as we get to in a minute, from a management point of view as well. Allison, yes, anything that, else from your perspective? Yeah, just adding to that. I mean, I think keeping a diary, right? It's it's a useful diagnostic tool, but I think Josh is alluding to we we think of it really as a kind of a management tool as well that. A di- voiding diary can be a kind of therapeutic intervention almost. It's a core compartment right. of much sort of behavioral treatment oh. programs for your incontinence because as people realize when they're voiding, when they're leaking, what the stimuli and the, the precipitators are, they can start to change their behavior. Exactly. And and it's also empowerment. So, and I'll just tell you one quick story. It hasn't happened often, but it's happened a couple of times in, in my career where you know we, we, we mail this voiding record, voiding sheet, 40-hour voiding sheet to a patient, and and this is particularly true with people who are you know more educated, more more attuned to their health, and they come to the clinic, and the problem is no longer is resolved. Okay, and and as Allison was alluding to, simply by paying more attention to this and recording all this detail, they kind of figured it out, and and they and then they basically treat themselves, and we'll get to that in a minute in terms of how you can how you can manage these issues. Well, it's behavioral approaches, but it's also fluid management, and we'll, we'll talk about all that in a minute. And George, would you be willing to share your your forty eight hour diary? Sure. I mean, there are many in the public domain. I can I can I can email them. Great, quickly. wonderful. We'll include a link to that on our show sure. notes. Um, before we get into interventions and treatments, I mean, urgency. Commonly, people get a UA, and for other types of incontinence too. What, where does a UA and a culture fit into all of this? Given that you know, rates of asymptomatic bacteria are also high in this population. Oh, that, that's a, that's a amazing. That's a wonderful question. You're bringing up, I think, a, a challenging issue here. You're right. But uh, clinical guidelines for evaluation of overactive bladder, certainly most forms of urine incontinence do do recommend uh, performing urinalysis. And yet, you could say if you're trying to evaluate an older patient who's had chronic intermittent uh, urinary symptoms for years, you know. <laughs> How likely it is it that a acute UTI is is really the what's responsible there? And you, you, you certainly could argue that you know we're systematically performing your analyses uh, in all of these patients because we can and because the guidelines say. Are we increasingly just picking up you know for example the uh, 
20% of older women who have some degree of asymptomatic bacteria? Um, are we just you know, starting ourselves down the road towards more antibiotic over treatment for bacteria and resistant yeah. infections and resistant urinary tract infections down the line? It's a it's a really challenging area. It's one honestly where I feel like we need a lot more research. What okay. do you do in clinical practice, Allison? <laughs> So I, I think we, we actually really need to take the time to ask patients more about the nature of their symptoms. Yeah. Like th there are some folks that could benefit from your analysis. Yeah. There are some folks where... Acute onset urgency seems very reasonable. Yes, yeah, very right. reasonable. Right. Intermittent chronic symptoms over time, not so much so reasonable. So I, I have to say I don't systematically perform your analyses in all you know older patients who are presenting yeah. with these symptoms which in some ways might be in contrast to guidelines. Yeah. How do you think about it, George? No, I, I completely agree. I'm going to say the same thing. Right now, it's it, we need more research. I mean, yeah. this is really unclear. But I agree, if somebody has recent change in symptoms, that's, that's probably reasonable yeah. to do it. But otherwise, probably not necessary. Okay. You know, Eric, you, you, you're sort of bringing up the fact that there are multiple urinary syndromes that we see often in older adults, and they, they can overlap, uh, but they can also be distinct. And it, recurrent urinary tract infections is considered sort of a urologic syndrome, you know, in, in older adults also, um, and where kind of overactive bladder and urgency incontinence might end and recurrent urinary tract infections begin. It's a, and, and other syndromes like genitourinary syndrome of menopause in older women, for example, I think we, we need a lot more work to be able to tease apart yeah. the overlap yeah. and the distinctions between these. Okay. We're going to move to, to treatments because this comes up an issue with like stress and urgency. Like sometimes it's important to know exactly which bucket these fall into, but there are some non-pharmacological treatments that may work for multiple. Is that like Kegel yeah. exercises come up a lot? So you're right. I mean, I think we often think that first line treatment for more than one type of uh, urinary incontinence involves behavioral treatment, behavioral yeah. changes. Um, and George has already mentioned a few of these, whether it's sort of timed urination, you know, changes in fluid intake, suppressing unwanted sort of blad urges to urinate uh, when they first come on in order to sort of train the bladder to, to, to get used to, to accommodating greater urine volume. Uh, so in some ways, we, we have the best evidence base for these kinds of behavioral approaches for more than one form of urinary incontinence in older adults, provided that we can teach people to use them and they can practice them effectively and consistently. Is there a good way to do that? <laughs> Aside from referring somebody to, uh, what do you call somebody who does? I think you, uh, you're, again, bringing up the challenges. So I think that when... Older adults have access to clinicians who yeah. have training on educating like and counseling patients. Neurogynecologists. Yes, that's right. And sometimes, you know, uh, to pelvic floor physical therapists, to nurses or practice assistants who have training in teaching these techniques and guiding patients and practices them, then great. What, I think what's challenging is that many older adults don't have access to, yeah. to clinicians who can provide that kind of training and support. And clinicians feel strapped, you know, they don't have enough time to teach. They they revert towards the things they know best and are perhaps the most lucrative for their practices, right? Uh, I'm an internal medicine physician. What do we do? We, we prescribe. We prescribe medicines, right, right. And and what do well, urolo urologists and urogynecologists are surgeons or surgical yeah. specialists, you know? Procedures are, are, are what they do. And so I think a great many older adults don't have access to education and support that they need. Yeah. So there's a systemic problem that needs to be addressed around the way our system reimburses for right. medications more than for um, physical therapy, for example, right. and the way that maybe patients may expect, have come to expect that if they go to their doctor, they'll get a prescription. Right. Not yes. I mean, you could just argue that any kind of syndrome or condition that affects you know, as many of half of older women in the community, you know, as a, a third of older men in the community, really requires more creative approaches to delivering treatment. Our traditional kind of one-on-one -on -one intense clinician visit model of delivering care is just simply not adequate to address the needs of the vast majority of older adults who, who have these, these symptoms. Well and, and Allison, in your own clinic, do you have like 
a go to kind of strategy how you think about non pharmacological therapy yeah. for let's say urge incontinence or stress? I mean, I, I think we should start with the behavioral because sometimes uh-huh. there really are yeah. even low hanging fruit, obvious behavioral practices, triggers that that patients can recognize. So some of that is being ready with high quality, patient friendly information uh, to to provide to hand out. Sometimes, often with with bladder diaries, but avoiding diaries is really helpful. Right? Yeah. Um, there, I think there are going to be patients who, who are going to have trouble practicing. So, I, I mean, now I think there are there are videos online that can help people understand and maintain mm-hmm. their practice. As I mentioned, I'm doing other work that's sort of, you know, looking into smartphone tools or uh, to, to sort of support people in making these changes. Because really, when it comes to behavioral, we're talking about self-management. Like, treatment is self-treatment. It's just yeah. that older, older adults need to be able to have the support and, and information to do it effectively and to maintain those changes over time. Right? Then there's some folks who, who can't or don't want to engage in behavioral practices or they don't get the benefit from the behavioral practices. And, and we think about, oh, are you somebody who could benefit from a medication yeah. or a procedure? Uh, thoughts from a non-pharmacological perspective, George, when you're thinking about these these different buckets or these mixes of yeah, incontinence? So I, I think it, it, the way I think about it is, first of all, looking at, at, at fluid intake. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, there are simple issues that can be addressed, such as somebody who you know drinks large amounts of caffeinated beverages and, and, and such certain times of the day, especially before they go to sleep. Um, when when pe- Times when people take their diuretics can be important. Uh, medication. There's a lot of medications that actually make voiding much worse. That, that really have, have problems. And then in terms of behavioral interventions, you know, the combination of two things that really work well, and it's been shown in the literature over and over again, is is one improving mobility. The moment you improve mobility, you, you're improving voiding issues. Very, very logical for many reasons. The other that really helps is distraction exercises. You know, what I often tell people is that. You know, when, when they feel, particularly when they feel the urgent sense of urgency, the, the, the normal natural reaction is to think of, you know, I need to get to the bathroom and thinking of ways of getting as, to the bathroom as quickly as possible. And in fact, there's a lot of literature, including, you know, very good behavioral literature showing the distraction in terms of thinking about anything else. So I tell people, for example, to think about, okay, if you if you walk from your house to the bank, okay, Think about all the all the streets that you're going to have to cross. Okay, think about the names of, you know, all the vegetables you can think of that begin with the letter A or B. You know, anything that will distract them. Okay, yeah. And be, think about anything other than voiding. It will help. And and there's extensive literature literature to support that, including people who are cognitively impaired. Actually, one of our colleagues, uh, Joe Auslander, who works with Alex and I on Jags, he and Jack Schnelli published a, a study many years ago, done in the VA, so all men, obviously, that simply, you know, some very, some mobility exercise, getting people to void, helping them go to the bathroom, and some distraction exercises improved voiding issues and incontinence dramatically. Now, there's data that they never published, but I've seen them present, is which has to do with how our healthcare system functions, is the moment the research study ended, there was decay in terms of all the improvements. So that's, so it works. The yeah. problem is it's a lot easier to write, to pull out the, pres- you know, to, to prescribe something, to pr- prescribe a med sure. than to prescribe something that involves behavioral intervention. But if you, you, if you have a caregiver, if you have a caregiver who is involved and dedicated, having them walk the person to the bathroom on a regular basis, you know, what we call prompted or timed voiding on a schedule. And again, the schedule can be adapted, should be adapted to the voiding record, okay? Because every person is different. Yeah. Uh, in many cases, if you think about it physiologically, um, and again, I don't get into all the details, but if you think about bladder filling and bladder physiology, simply keeping bladder volumes under a critical threshold in an individual may be enough to keep them from developing urgency in the first place, yeah. okay? And you can figure that out by talking to them in many ways. Well, let's talk about the pharmacological treatments because th- that that plays an interesting role here. So, so for urgency incontinence, I always think about the beta three agonists. So you got it was at Mirabegron, and then you have antimuscarinic agents, your ditropans of the world. Are there are there any other classes I'm forgetting about? 
those are the two main classes the two of main class. bladder antispasmodic. Efficacy, same? One's better than the other? What do you think? You know, it's, uh, again, you bring up great questions because there are few head-to-head trials comparing the efficacy of different types of bladder antispasmodic medications. Um, most of the trials that have been conducted right, are, are conducted by the manufacturers of those medications and perhaps more than you would expect by chance, you know, the, the findings tend to be favorable for the medication, you know, the, the more expensive the sponsor. Uh, it could be, you know, I think right now you're probably aware, you know, there's a lot of concern about potential adverse effects of anti-muscarinic. Yeah, they're in the beers criteria, right? They've been in the beers criteria for a while. I think there's growing concern, um, workshops, symposia at at society meetings, right, about about the concern about these medications. Most of it is based on sort of retrospective analyses of data. Uh, So we we don't necessarily have the highest quality evidence to really look at uh, what are the potential adverse effects on, for example, cognition in older yeah. adults of taking these medications over time. I think we we need higher quality data. Honestly, we could really use better randomized trial data looking prospectively on what are the implications in the short term and the longer term of different classes of bladder antispasmodic medications um, rather than what we, we usually have, which is you know relatively short studies. Yeah. Again, like conducted by the, the manufacturers of the medications, sometimes in populations yeah. that in the end aren't as representative of the older adults in the community who are going to take them uh, and really uh, try to understand this. There's there's what we want, and then there's what nice. we have. So when push comes to shove, you got a 76 year old with mild dementia coming into your clinic with urgency incontinence. You've tried non pharmacological therapies, George, and you're thinking about pharmacological prescription. What do you do? Which do you choose? So I, I have done it both ways. I, I have prescribed Marambegron on occasion, and I also have a lot of experience prescribing the antispasmodics. And let's put it this way. There, there are differences between them, and the pharmaceutical companies certainly play upon them in terms of being more selective for, for certain muscarinic respect receptors. There are some potential differences in blood in ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, although none of these have been studied in people with dementia, where we know the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. So my approach to this has been to use these drugs as a really last-ditch measure when the condition is really impacting, has a real impact on the person's quality of life, okay? Yeah. And what I try to do is use the lowest dose possible as rarely as possible at times of day when the symptoms are worse, okay? And what, I, what I'm getting at is, again, the bladder diary tells you a lot. When, the, when are the symptoms worse and most bothersome, okay? And and to give you an example, for a person who has regular urgent, urgent continence, um, it's, it may be the two two or three hours when they need to get to the market, okay? And just make, make it to the grocery store that may be a small dose of uh, short-acting any one of the yeah. anticholinergics, you know? Um, and again, lowest dose possible. I think there's some place also for the, I've also used on occasion some some of the, the transdermal, uh, which have the advantage of being much smoother. And that I use in people who have symptoms yeah. around the clock. They also don't have the hepatic metabolite issue, the hepatic metabolism. But to me, it's a last ditch measure. Uh, it, and it George, what about those people with BPH? Yeah. But they also have urge symptoms. Right. You know, their PVRs aren't high. Is this something where you really want to avoid the antimuscarinics? Is there a role for... I think pati- generally, generally, I, I, I avoid them. I think this is this is the place. So I think for, for, for people, and I think you're referring to men with... with yeah. PVR, <laughs> I tend to focus much more on agents that target the prostate as yeah. much as possible. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, the, the... Your uh, alpha blockers, your finasterides. Blockers, finasteride. Partly because they do help, quite, they can be helpful, and and also because they're relatively well tolerated, and also it's been shown that with BPH, again the most bothersome symptoms. Okay, it's not flow rate, it's not retention, it's frequency and precipitancy, and and that's what you want to focus. On. That's what keeps people up at night. That's what you yeah. want to focus on. I tend to stay away from antispasmodics in in men with BPH issues that could be related to the BPH, in part because. Because, you know, I think th- th- there's the issue of retention in them. Yeah. And also, our colleagues in urology are not particularly happy when 
you prescribe an antispasmodic <laughs> one of these patients and they have to come in the middle of the night you know because they're in the ed with 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 you know four liters of urine yeah. infection right the, okay. the other group you have to be very careful for is that group i talked about earlier the people that neil resnick described many yeah. years ago, combination of overactive bladder underactive bladder th- there's some evidence that that antispasmodics can actually induce retention in them so again you have to be care- very careful with them. Okay, last one. Each of you get one pro tip for our listeners about how you think about your know, management. Could be workup of urinary incontinence. Allison, what would your pro tip be? I, I think a uh, bigger pro tip is that we, it's important to be honest about the evidence and the limitations of the evidence. George was just talking about, you know, bladder medications. I think we need to acknowledge that regardless of the type of medications, you know, the evidence we have suggests that benefits are modest in terms of improving symptoms, that we have reason to think there are side effects, and that there are also some potential side effects that we simply don't know about yet. You know, we have to acknowledge when there's uncertainty in the evidence and make that part of our shared decision making about what kind of treatment approaches to try. Great. George, pro tip? Well, I'm going to go a different direction here, and I completely agree with what Allison said, but but I, I, I want to sh- give a shout out to the need for people to do, you know, high quality research in this area. There's just very little research being done. And I'll, I'll just share a story that a son of a patient of mine asked me, which illustrates how little we know. And the question was this, and he said, Dr. Kushal, I understand this. My mother is on a medication to block the cholinergic system, anticholinergic, to help her with her continence. And she's on another medication to boost her anti- her cholinergic system to help her with her dementia. And it doesn't make any sense to me. And my answer was, well, it doesn't make any sense. And I'll, I'll take it a step further. So I pulled this out and I have a question for you. What do you think is the longest published textbook of medicine in the English language? Um, uh, ooh, Osler's? BMJ? <laughs> I hate to disappoint you, but it's actually published by a drug company. It's called the Merck Manual. And first first edition was in eighteen in 1899, okay? And the reason I'm, I brought that up, 1899, we're talking about a century, you know, we're talking about a long time ago, 120-odd years ago. If you go in there and you look up, you don't find Alzheimer's disease because it didn't ex- because Alzheimer's hadn't discovered Alzheimer's disease yet. But if you look at treatment of Alzheimer's disease, there's an extract of a plant called physostigma. What do you think that is? Uh, belladonna? Well, that's no. <laughs> physostigma is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, okay? Uh-huh. It's it's the same principle as donepezil, okay? Yeah. And if you look at irritative bladder, okay, what's the treatment? Atropine. <laughs> okay. So in 120 years, we're still prescribing we're this still, thing. Yeah. So we have we have a lot of work to do. The last thing I'm going to say is that ultimately mobility, behavior, and I think long term it's going to be prevention of things like uh, microvascular disease, heart disease. That's really going to make an impact on. There's a lot of, and I'm sure Scott Bauer talked about that. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on. But before we end, I think we got a little bit more Britney Spears, right, Alex? <laughs> Oops, I did it again I played with your heart Got lost in the game Oops, you think I'm in love I'm set from above I'm not that innocent Alice and George, thank you for joining us on this Jerry Pal podcast. Thank you. <laughs> thank to, you so much for having us. Thank and you. to all of our listeners, thank you for your continued support. And we'd also like to thank our donors who've donated more than $250, including Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Woolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, Bob Rixey, Patrick Lally, Matt Schuster, James Tulski, Annie Hargadon, Jeffrey Galbraith, Daryl Lowens, Meg Walhagen, Susan Nelson, Sharon Bragman, Harry Hahn, Jessica McFarlane, Victoria Braun, Diane Meyer, Mike Steinman and Dorothy Richmond, Wendy Peltier, Kelly Strait, Craig China, Ron Saber, Rebecca Goldstein, and Elizabeth Chung. And again, those are the ones who've donated more than $250 in the last year. If you're interested in donating, click on the little donate button. Or if you just want to share our podcast on other podcasting platforms or Twitter or any other social media sites, that's good too. 
And if I mispronounced your name, please shoot me an email. I will correct it the next time we record one of these. Thank you.